So now let's get into the word. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. We will get one to you. We're going to be in Psalm chapter 18 today. Um, and we won't get through all of it. We're actually only going to get through half. Psalm 18 is about 50 verses long. And while I wanted to try to get through the whole thing, I didn't think it'd be a good idea. So we're just going to do half today. We're in Psalm chapter 18. All right, so a little bit of context for this really long psalm because we've been going through it for two weeks. And so this is a psalm of David, and we've been talking about David a lot as we go through the psalms. And so some things that you want to know about this one. So when David is writing this or speaking this, this is near the end of his life. He's kind of been through everything, and he's old and weary now, and he's writing this psalm. And what it is is David looking back on what God has done for him. And this is an outpouring of his heart, a recounting of everything that God has done. And so some things that we're going to see are Saul, the king who was before him, and Absalom, his son, kind of his enemies. They're, they're gone now. They have lived. They've come against him. They've died. The Philistine giants who tried to come against David, they are also been dispatched. Now, in studying this, I didn't realize there was more than one giant that tried to kill David. I thought it was just Goliath. There's four other ones that come against him. And either David or his boys have to step in and help him, right? So like I said, David is old and weary. And so one of the last giants that tries to come against David, David doesn't have the energy to fight him. And so one of his mighty men actually has to step in and take out the giant for him. And after that fight, David's mighty men tell him, you're done, dude. You're too old. You can't, if you die, the flame of Israel is extinguished. You're not allowed to come fight with us anymore. And David says, okay, he steps back, he agrees. We see all the things that his mighty men have done. And in that time when David is this old man, his boys tell him he can't fight anymore. He sits back. And he looks at everything God has done. And this is the psalm that he writes. And so if you want to see that story, this same psalm is um, given almost word for word in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22. Um, but here we're going to see David recounting how God delivered him from all of his enemies. And my prayer for us is that we will see that this same God, this same stronghold for David, is the same God and the same stronghold for us. And we can cry out like David, I love you, O oh Lord. So before we get into the text, let's pray. God, we thank you so much for everything that you are about to do tonight. We are excited to see you move in mighty ways, God, in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds. Teach us, Jesus. We want to see you for who you are. We want to know that you are our stronghold. For my brothers and sisters here in the place, Lord, who are struggling, who are in pain, comfort them. Let them see the beauty of you as their defender. For the lost, Lord, I pray that they would see the invitation to come and stay in the shadow of the Most High and find peace and joy. For me, Lord, I ask that you would anoint me so that I would be a blessing to my brothers and sisters. May I decrease that you would increase in me and all of us. Show us, Lord, teach us how to love you, to recount your faithfulness, and to rejoice in all that you've done. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so let's jump now into Psalm 18. We're going to read the little introduction there. And it says, For the choir director, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spoke to the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So a couple things we're going to see. We're going to go into detail about all the stuff I'm about to mention. I just kind of wanted to give a quick recap. So if we look at David's life, Something that will stick out is this man had an incredible amount of enemies. David had more people try to kill him than I think any of us can even fathom. And so when David says, my enemies come against me, he's not saying people who are my haters. These are people with weapons and armies and intent to take his life. And there are thousands of them that try to come against David. His most aggressive enemies are the ones that are actually closest to him. King Saul, this king who he served faithfully, went up against Goliath to defend him and all of Israel, played with him when he was haunted. David loved Saul, and Saul tried to kill him, hunted him with an army. Same for his son Absalom. This boy who he, he loved and raised would come against him with an army, try to turn Israel against him. And so David has all of these enemies. He's got to run and hide. And so the psalm that we're about to go through is David talking about all of these enemies that he has. And for you and me, it's going to be really easy to go, well, what does this have to do with me? I don't have this many enemies. I don't even have enemies of that kind, right? Like, ain't nobody trying to kill me. I hope nobody's trying to kill you. If they are, please let us know so we can pray for you. <laughs> 
But like none of us knows what it's like to have an army trying to take our life. People that we love really trying to kill us. And so when I was reading through this, I was like, man, how do I teach this? We don't know what this is like. But the beauty of scripture is that we can see what David was going through and God has given us wisdom to see how this applies to us and that's this. David's greatest enemy is our greatest enemy. Because David's greatest enemy was not Saul, it was not his son, it was not the people who tried to kill him, it was sin. It was Satan, it was the flesh, these things that try to come against him all the time. And we can see that David had many sins. He's, he's lying and cheating and stealing and killing and all of this stuff and it haunted him. And you can see that as you read through the Psalms, he's broken over these things, but he also has these moments where he sees God forgive him. And so for you and I, I want us to come into this Psalm with that same realization, like yeah, we don't have enemies maybe like David did, but his enemy is still our enemy. The sin that haunted him is a sin that still tries to take from us. Satan is the same. And so we want to be wise as we come through this. Now, even through all of that, David understands that God is his shelter. And that's what we need to come to understand and to love, that God is our shelter. Now, as much as David has been through it, he's been a knucklehead, he's been a sinner, he's also been a great man. He was a faithful shepherd for his father. This dude defended his sheep against lions and bears. I'm sorry, if I'm your shepherd as like a, in, in a field and there's some sheep and a bear comes, your sheep are gone. <laughs> I'm out. But David stood there, took them by the beard and punched them in the face. And he said to Goliath, God delivered them into my hand and God will deliver you into my hand. So David did not think he was strong enough himself. Faithful shepherd, mighty warrior under Saul. This dude fought so many people. They sang songs about how great he was as a warrior. And then he was the king of Israel. That's a beautiful place to be. But with all of that, all the accolades and all the trophies and all the titles, look how David addresses himself in this song. The servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord. Why? Because as David looks back, he sees God has done all this. What place would I have for pride? What titles or trophies can we ever bring before a holy God? David's not going to stand before God and go, well, you know, I'm the king, so we're, we're kind of homies. No. <laughs> Servant of the Most High. When I stand before God the day that I die or he takes me home, he's not going to call me Pastor Myola. But I pray that I hear, well done, good and faithful servant. David here is a servant of the Lord. And that is not a demeaning position at all. It's a beautiful thing to be a servant of God. And so having thought through all that God has done, David now delivers these words. Find me in verse 1. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Family, memorize these verses. Because I promise you, in times of struggle and trial, these words are such a comfort. As they are to David, they can be to us. Memorize these words, because they will bless you. Now I want us to go through these words and notice the first thing that comes out of David's mouth after he looks back on his life, sees that God has delivered him from all his enemies. The first thing that comes out of David's mouth, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I love you. And this is such a beautiful way that he uses love because the word that he uses here is not the word that's most commonly used for love. In fact, this is the only time that this Hebrew word is translated as love. Most times it's translated as compassion, or pity, or mercy. And it's usually from God to people. But David here uses the word to say, I love you, God. And so it's kind of confusing because you're going, well, how can you have compassion on God? But that's not it. When someone has compassion on you, there is a sense of tenderness, of intimacy, and of care. And this is what David is saying to God. This is an intimate thing. Uh, John MacArthur says it this way. It's a rare verb form of a word that expresses tender intimacy. David's choice of words is intended to express very strong devotion. And so it's almost like, you know, we will say often in Christianity, love is a verb. It's something that you do, and that's very true. But here, I think David is more appealing to that emotion. 
that intimacy. I love you, God. I want to be near to you. There's a devotion here. Now, I want us, before we go any further, to remember what the greatest commandments are. So these will be overhead for us. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Man comes to Jesus and says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus says to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. So the greatest commandment that we can fulfill is to love God and to love people. And here's the beauty of that commandment. The only reason we can love God is because he has loved us. If he does not first love us, then we cannot love him. And so for David, as he recounts his life, what he's seeing is not just protection, but God's love for him. And because he has seen God's love for him, he can now reply with, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Now he says often in these verses, my, my God, my fortress, my stronghold, my shield. And what I want us to understand is when he's saying my, this is not him taking possession of a holy God, right? It's not like when two kids are fighting over something, they're going, mine, this is mine, right? Like this, uh, this picture here. So you see this uh, <laughs> beautiful sibling relationship we got going on. But you'll see kids do this. This is mine. This is mine. It's, it's an act of possession, right? It belongs to me. And it's almost selfish in nature. And that's not what David is saying here. Now, when God says to us, you are mine, we are his possession. We are his creation. We are his sons and daughters, his bond servants. We belong to him. But when we say, my God, it's not like we're taking possession of him, right? For those of you who've been on island long, uh, long enough, you remember the commercial? That's my bank. He didn't own that bank. And so when David says, that's my God, he doesn't own God. It's more like saying, that's my bride or that's my church, right? I, my bride doesn't belong to me. She's not a possession. I am part of her. We are one in Christ. And so she is the one whom I love. She is the one who I desire to be with. And it is the same with the church. If any pastor ever says with possession in his mind, this is my church, somebody better rebuke that dude. But if all of us come here every week and say, this is my church, we know we mean we belong here. This is my family. God has brought me here. So when David says, my God, that's what he means. I belong to him. This is the one in whom my heart delights. I love him. My God, my stronghold. And again, there's that intimacy there, right? This is not some foreign deity that he's not familiar with. My God, my stronghold, my fortress. And he says, God is my rock my fortress and my deliverer. And so David speaks here of shelter and, and protection and all this really cool stuff. And the word that he uses for rock is the word for like rocky crag, kind of describing the, the mountain area which he lived, which is really cool because uh, I have this picture, or do I have this picture? We do not have this picture. Never mind. Okay. So I, I took a picture. There's a bunch of caves in Israel. Uh, and they're, cave, they're called the caves of Adullam. And they're actually mentioned in scriptures like this is where David went to go hide. Those caves are still there. You can go into these caves and see them. And it's really cool because as you're reading the story, David is in there with his boys, his army. So you think it's like this gigantic opening, this massive cave, but the opening is probably about yay big. And the cave is deep inside, but the opening is really small. Now, why would that be? Well, because you don't want to be found. And so David, in running from all these people, has to go hide in these rocks, in these strongholds, in these crags. And so literally, David knows what it means to hide in the shelter of God. These rocks were his fortress. These rocks were his rocks. These rocks were his, his, his stronghold. But notice, even if the rocks are the thing in which he hid, he gives glory to God. God, you are my rock. You are my fortress. You are my stronghold. No, it was really, really cool because a, a fortress is something that is man-made, right? Built by man. A stronghold is anything that you can go in and hide out and be safe in. And so as I was looking for pictures for fortresses from the days of David, there aren't any. The man-made fortresses have all fallen. Even from way after David to the time of Jesus, those fortresses are gone. They're down to just the foundation. But the strongholds that God built in the hills of Israel, oh, they're still there, baby. Man-made fortresses will fall. The fortress of God stands forever. Amen. And so for us, what does that look like? What are our man-made fortresses? Where do we try to find shelter and build up our own thing outside of God? We try to build up our fortresses of how people think about us. 
I will be safe if people see me this way. Or I will, I will feel safe when people accept that I am this or I am that. Or I will feel safe when I can control this situation, have this person in my life. There is my stronghold. Every human stronghold will fall. But the fortresses of God stand forever. Trust in God that he will protect and shelter you. And so David calls God again, my shield. And then he says, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And so what is the horn of my salvation, right? I don't think anybody reads that and goes, yep, got it, understand. <laughs> it's kind of an odd phrase. And so when he talks about the horn of my salvation in Israel and all throughout kind of ancient history, the horn is a, a symbol of strength, right? So if you look at a bull or an ox, that horn is a symbol of strength, right? Look at this thing. That's a bull. Now go like that and try to cover the horns. What is that? That's a cow. Now move your thumbs. That's a bull. If a cow comes after you, oh, cute. If a bull comes after you, run. Because there is strength in the horn of the bull. And so when he says, God, you are the horn of my salvation, you are the strength, God, of my salvation. God is the strength of his salvation. But... This strength is not one of protection, right? All up until this point, we've seen David call God his protector, his shelter, his stronghold, his fortress, his rock, but the horn is a weapon. It is one of offense, right? And so God is not just David's defender. He is also the power to attack, to come against the enemy. And so when we look at Jesus, he didn't just live a perfect life and die on the cross as this passive move against Satan. That was an assault on the gates of hell. That was an assault on what God was trying to, um, what Satan was trying to keep Jesus from doing. And so David here has God not just as a defender, but as the power to come against the enemy. And so still, God does not just stand in our defense today. I think often we, we, we're going through struggles especially, we'll look at God and go, okay, you're just letting me go through this. You're sitting up there on your throne watching me go through and just going, keep going. Keep going, keep going, uh-uh. God is not just our defender. God has given us weapons of our warfare to destroy the strongholds of the enemy. Second Corinthians 10, three through four says this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now in 2 Corinthians, that word fortresses is a man-made stronghold meant to hold people in there for weeks or months at a time. The only way to destroy a fortress in this day and age was siege warfare. Either you lock them in and starve them out or you pummel it for months at a time. So when we read the weapons of our warfare destroy fortresses, this isn't some Manini weapon. The weapons that God gives us destroys the strongholds of Satan. God is our horn, the horn of our salvation. And so what are the weapons then that God has given us? There are many. Confession is a weapon, spiritual. Prayer, absolutely. Worship, fellowship, community, love, hope, joy, peace. These are spiritual weapons designed to take down the strongholds of the enemy in others and in us. Now, when we read David's life, it's really easy to go, okay, David had it easy. We can read through his whole life in an hour, maybe two, and go, yeah, look, he prayed, God answered. He prayed, God answered. He prayed, God answered. Family, never forget, there are years between some of these pages. David is sitting back here, not as a man who's had an easy life and says, yeah, God's my fortress. David has been through the ringer for years at a time sometimes, and still he will cry out, my God, my fortress, I love you. Because no matter what is coming against him, he knows who his God is. So whether you are in the fire with God for a few minutes or wandering through the desert for 40 years, the truth is the same. God is the horn of my salvation. Trust in the Lord as your fortress. In verse three here, back in the text, David says, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. I want us to understand something very, very powerful and if we can really, really get this, 
is gonna bless all of our lives. Our greatest strength is in our greatest dependence on God. The time where we are strongest is when we are most dependent on God. Notice he says, I call upon the Lord. He's not calling the Lord to tell him, I got this. I am crying out to God. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. To call upon the Lord is not an act of failure. And I think so often I see this in Christians. It's like, I don't, I don't want to ask God for that because he's busy. He's got better things to do. This isn't that important. Do you think your God is limited and he can only do an X amount of things at a time? Like he's like, look, I really want to help you with this situation, but I got some other stuff going on over here. I'll get to you when I can. God delights in us, and we'll see that um, later at the end of the message. But what I want us to understand is there's nothing we cannot bring before God, as long as it is honoring to him, right? If we're asking God to give us stupid stuff, you can bring it before him. He's not going to answer you. But where we're, we're hurting, when we're in distress, he loves his children, and he desires to come and help us. So to call upon God is not an act of failure, as though you didn't do enough, and now you've got to act God. No. To call out to God is an act of humility. I need you, Lord. And it is a beautiful thing that we do. So often we get into trouble because here we have this fortress, this stronghold, the horn of our salvation, a place where we can go and hide. And we stand outside of the stronghold and watch the enemy march against us and go, I get him. Satan is getting closer and closer. Mm, he's still a little ways off. And we'll wait until he smacks us in the face to go, I probably should have been in the stronghold family, when you see the enemy moving, we have to understand we do not have the strength to fight him, to fight our sin, to fight our flesh. Our strength comes from God and a dependence on him. And so we cry out, we call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and he will save us. Call upon the Lord is to recognize the role of God as our defender and our role is being dependent on him. So cry out to the Lord. Find me now in verse four. We're going to see David um, say some stuff and then we'll go over it. Verse 4, the cords of death encompassed me and the torrents of ungodliness terrified me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me, the snares of death confronted me. Now it's easy sometimes to read Psalms like this and go, David was kind of dramatic. Right, like when you read that, people don't talk like that today. The cords of death surrounded me and, and my enemy was all about me. We don't talk like that. So we can read that and go, David's dramatic. He's not. When David says death is coming for me, he means it. Now think about, again, all the enemies that had come against him. Absalom, his son, had rallied an army to come against him. Same thing with Saul. Think about him facing down Goliath. Goliath was nine foot six. Goliath's spear was taller than David. His shield probably weighed more than David did. If Goliath hit him once, he's dead. And so when he says, my enemies are about me and death encompasses me, he's not being hyperbolic. David at any moment could die should the Lord remove his protection, but David knows the Lord is with him. And so he can stare down this giant with a rock and a sling because it wasn't the rock and the sling that killed Goliath. It was God. And David stood in confidence that God was his defender. Now again, David's greatest enemy is Satan. And so we can even read the words he's talking about us here and see that death encompasses us, right? Sheol is coming for us because Satan is our enemy. Now we know the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The problem is we've repeated that so much, those words have lost meaning, right? Satan does not come to flatten our tires and make us stub our toes. <laughs> I think often we kind of minimize him as like this teddy bear. He's like, oh, there he goes making trouble again. Like he's a Sour Patch Kid. <laughs> the Bible says the enemy comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He's come to steal from us everything that God desires that we have, to rob us of the fullness of the joy of God. He comes to kill us in any way he can, to kill our joy, to kill our peace, to kill our relationships with one another to kill us if he can, to destroy our hope, to destroy our peace, to destroy our relationships. Satan is coming as his enemy. He is likened to a prowling lion for a reason. He is a very real enemy. But let me tell you about God. 
He can come against us all he wants because if God is for us, who can be against us? Satan will come, but we stand as children of the Most High. God is our defender, our protector, and the horn of our salvation. Let Satan do his thing because God's going to do his. And if you are his child, then you stand in his protection. And so when we look to God as our fortress, as our shield, as our strength, we can cry out, we love you, O Lord, our God. And so David here is giving you this picture of all this death coming around him. Now notice what he says in verse 6. David says, in my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry for help came before him into his ears. Notice David says, in my distress. David knows God. He knows God is his defender. He knows God is his protector. But still, what does he say? In my distress, in my need, in my anxiety. David is human. He's not immune to distress. He's not immune to worry. He's not immune to anxiety. These are real things. But in his distress, what does he do? I call upon the Lord. Exactly. Listen, family, if we experience pain, trauma, hurt, people wronging us, people hating us, people trying to spread rumors about us, people leaving us, abandoning us, doing all kinds of crazy stuff, you're going to have feelings and emotions and distress and anxiety that's real. It's okay. You can come to God and say, I don't like this. This isn't pleasant. This isn't comfortable. I'm worried. I'm afraid. That's okay. But do you call upon the Lord, he who is mighty to save? What do we do when we are in distress? This is a verse that I have memorized for myself, and I say it every time I come up to preach. This will be overhead here. Psalm 50, verse 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. That word trouble is the same word for distress or need. And so before I come up to preach, I remind myself of that because I am in need anytime I come up here. And God says, if I call upon him, he will deliver me and I will glorify him. And that is the desire of every faithful preacher to glorify God. And so call upon the Lord. Now here is what is awesome. The comfort that we get is not from in calling to him, but that God hears us. We can call to him all we want, but that's not where the comfort lies. The comfort lies in he hears us. And David said, he heard my voice out of his temple and my cry for help came before him into his ears. God hears our prayers. Amen. And if God hears our prayers and he loves us, God will answer. Not always in the timing that we want, not always in the way that we want, because if we're honest, God knows better than we do. Big surprise. <laughs> but he answers us. And we're about to see how God answers, how God responds. Find me in verse 7. So I'm just going to recap real quick. David, I love you, God. You've been my stronghold. All this bad stuff is coming against me. I'm in trouble. I'm in distress. I cry out to you, God. Verse 7, God responds. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of the mountains were trembling and were shaking because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils. The fire from his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew. He sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him. Darkness of waters, thick clouds of the sky. From the brightness before him passed his thick clouds hailstones and coals of fire the lord also thundered in the heavens and the most high uttered his voice hailstone and coals of fire he sent out his arrows and scattered them the lightning flashes in abundance and routed them the channels of water appeared and the foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke O lord at the blast of the breath of your nostrils somebody is about to catch cracks <laughs> Somebody is about to get it. This is what I imagine here is God is seated on his throne. David cries out for help and God stands up. You better watch out. <laughs> Somebody is about to catch cracks and it ain't David. Notice the language here. The earth shook and it quaked. The foundations of the mountains trembled and they were shaken. Why? Because God was angry. 
God here is angry. Now, this is poetic language used to display what God is doing. Right? This isn't literal. It's not like every time one of his kids is in trouble, the mountains shake, the earth would never stop moving. <laughs> but it's this sense of God is moving and creation itself trembles when God moves. He is angry because his children are in trouble. Now, check this out. The things that we see as immovable, the earth, the mountains, right? These things are solid and steadfast. Like I said, those caves are still there to this day. These things are immovable. These things shake under the mighty hand of God. And so when we cry out for help, when we're in trouble, this is the God that hears our prayers. This is the God that responds. And this is the God that is our shelter. The one who makes the mountains tremble when he moves. Our God is our shelter. When you offer up prayers, when you cry out to God, remember who it is who hears you. Remember who it is that you cry out to and remember who it is who comes to our rescue. Charles Spurgeon says it this way. This will be overhead for you. Things were bad for David before he prayed. Amen. <laughs> but they were much worse for his foes so soon as the petition had gone up to heaven. A trustful heart by enlisting the divine aid, turns the tables on its enemies. If I must have an enemy, let him not be a man of prayer, or he will soon get the better of me by calling his God into the quarrel. Family, if we understood that this is what prayer does, that prayer is spiritual warfare, man, things would change. Pray, call out to God. In your distress and in your peace, call out to him because God hears and he answers. And when he gets up to move, <laughs> things happen. God's anger is kindled when his kids are attacked. And here, David has come under fire. Smoke and fire are used to show us the fierce anger of God. Check out verse 9. Verse 9 in Psalm 18 says this, He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. He rode upon a cherub and flew and sped upon the wings of the wind. All those words mean this. God did not take his time. He moved swiftly to come to the aid of his people. And again, it doesn't always feel like it. Right? It doesn't always feel like God comes quickly. Often we ask, where are you? What are you doing? What is taking so long, right? We've got to understand that God moves quickly, not in our measurement of things, but in his. Yes. Family, if we stop trying to measure God by what we see, we're going to find a lot of peace. Measure God by what he has said, what he has promised, and what he has done. And so often we're getting tired, we're getting weary for waiting for God to answer prayers, but God's timing is always perfect. I want to point us to the story of Lazarus as an example of this. So you can either turn with me to John 11, keep your finger in Psalm 18, but these verses will also be overhead if you want to follow along. John 11, find me in verse 3. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. He's talking about Lazarus. But when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not to end in death but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now notice this, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now they ask him, Jesus, will you come and heal him? My, my brother is sick. Does Jesus go right away? Nope, Lazarus dies. Lazarus dies and he's talking to his disciples and he's saying, look, this sickness is not gonna end in death, right? He's sleeping. And his disciples go, what do you mean he's if he's sleeping, he's going to wake up. And Jesus has to go, Lazarus is dead, guys. They don't understand, they don't get it. And so now, verse 13, this will be overhead. Jesus spoke of Lazarus' death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus had to say to them, Lazarus is dead. Notice verse 15. I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Jesus just said, I'm glad I wasn't there when Lazarus was sick. What? Lazarus died. What are you talking about? You're glad you weren't there. If you were there, nothing would have happened. So Lazarus is dead for four days by the time Jesus rolls up. I mean, verse 21, overhead here. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. 
and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And here is the big question. Do you believe this? And that is the question to all of us. Do you believe this? Jesus showed up four days late. Lazarus came out of that tomb. Jesus showed up late, according to everybody else. But he was not slow to react. He was not slow to respond. He came when he needed to, to glorify his name and for the best of those people who watched. And it is the same for us. When God appears to be slow, trust that he is doing something beyond your understanding, beyond your comprehension, and that he has his greatest glory and your greatest good in mind. Trust in the Lord who is our shelter and our most high. God is not lazy. He's not sitting on some recliner somewhere waiting for things to happen. God is always moving on our behalf. Jesus is always interceding on our behalf. The Holy Spirit intercedes for us and we don't even know how to. God is always moving because he is our shelter. And so God moves, he comes, he does all these things. He's quickly coming to help David. Verse 11 says this. He made darkness, talking about God, he made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him. Darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies from the brightness before him past his thick clouds hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstone and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. The channels of the water appeared. Foundations of the world were laid bare at your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of your breath, of your nostrils. And this is interesting because it says that God cloaked himself in darkness. That seems like a contradictory thing, but what's happening here is God is not cloaking himself in darkness from David but for a time is moving in darkness against David's enemies before he unleashes the assault on them. Hailstone, fire, darkness. This is all beckoning back to the Israelites in Egypt. Darkness, hailstone, coals of fire, lightning. This is all showing what God does to his enemies, to Pharaoh, to the Egyptians who would not let God's people go. This is the same God that moves on our behalf today. Now with all of that imagery, all of the fire and the lightning and the arrows and all that stuff, I still think verse 13 is the most fearsome thing in this whole psalm. The Lord also thundered in the heavens and the Most High uttered his voice. When God speaks, stuff happens. When God speaks, whatever he says goes down. And so if he is speaking against the enemies of David, it's happening. This is the same voice that said, let there be light, and there was. We don't even have a small unit of measurement for the power and the energy and the authority it would take to say, let there be light, and for light to appear. This is the same voice that said to the serpent, the seed of the woman will crush your head. You will crawl on the belly all your days and you will eat dirt. This is that same voice that spoke those words that now speaks against the enemies of David. When our greatest enemies, sin and the serpent, our flesh comes against us, remember what God has spoken, what he has uttered with his mighty voice, I will never leave or forsake you. I will be with you always to the end of the age. The work is finished. God is victorious over our sin, over our enemy and over death. We love you, O Lord, our strength. Our God is with us. And so whenever we're worried, we can rest in the shelter of the Most High knowing that our enemies is gonna get it. God is for us. Now let's move on to verse 16. You're gonna see a big uh, difference in the language that we just saw and the language that we're gonna see. Verse 16, he sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Do you see the difference between the language here? Thunder, coal, lightning, hailstone, fire, all of this stuff, and then he delivered me. He delighted in me. He drew me out. Notice the difference between how God deals with his enemies and how he deals with his children. You see the love and the compassion here. This is the difference between the lion and the lamb. They, God is both, right? Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah and the lamb that was slain for our sins. He is the lion to those who are his enemies and he is the lamb to those who are his children. There is such a love and a compassion 
and a beauty here, a gentleness in the way that he says he drew me out. He took me, he delivered me, he rescued me, he delighted in me. Now this God is no less fearsome than the God we just read about. But God is for David and not against him. And so all the might of the Almighty now works for God's glory and for David's good. And then it says there at the end, God delighted in me. God delighted in me. Just take a second to appreciate that statement, please. The God of all creation, the one who we just read about, that the mountains and the earth shake before him, that God delights in me. Now, if, let's say I don't want to read myself in the text. Let's just say he just delights in David, right? Which he doesn't. He delights in all of us. But let's just look at David. God delights in David? David, the guy who killed Uriah? David, the guy who took Bathsheba, who wasn't his wife? David, the guy who lied and got all his priests killed? David, the guy who tried to move the, the ark like he shouldn't and somebody died? That David? You delight in him. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Why would God delight in David? Bigger question, why would God delight in me? Because God loves David. Because God loves me. Because God loves you. And because when we come to him and he cleans us and makes us righteous, we are his delight. Amen. Because we glorify him. Because we display his love to the world. Because we honor him. Because we live in righteousness. God delights in us. So often we have this picture of God as though he's the parent that's just frustrated with us. Do you guys remember in elementary school you're doing math and your dad's sitting over you and you just can't figure it out and he goes, if Timmy had 10 watermelons <laughs> and he ate four, how many you get? I don't know, Dad. We look at God like that, like how many times you got to struggle with, uh-uh. He delights in us. He loves us and he cares for us. He's not sitting there going, right, you never figured this out yet. He loves us as his children and he delights in us. Sorry, I knew it wasn't just my dad. <laughs> but God does not treat us that way. He's not frustrated with us. He loves us. He delights in us. Find me now in verse 20. We're going to wrap this up here with David. And it says, the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness or dealt with me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands he has recompensed or rewarded me for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God for all his ordinances were before me and I did not put away his statutes from me I was also blameless with him and I kept myself from my iniquity therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyes now verses like this we need to approach carefully because we can read things into this text that will give us really bad thinking, right? And so this is not about earning or deserving God's favor. David is not saying, I was so good that I have earned this. Not at all. David is righteous, right? Well, actually kind of talked about this uh, last week. He read Psalm 15 and he said, uh, Psalm 17 verse 15, he said, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. And then Waxer, Waxer asked the question, Whose righteousness? And me and almost everybody else said, God's righteousness. And Waxer said, nope, David's righteousness. And I sat there and went, what do you mean David's righteousness? Is David righteous? Yeah. Who made him righteous? God. God has given David righteousness and now it belongs to him. And David knows without God doing this, he would not be righteous. He knows that this is from God because how did he start this psalm? God is my strength. God is my strength. God is my righteousness. And so David can say all of this kind of stuff like the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands. Because who made his hands clean? God did. And so this is not about earning God's favor. This is not about trying to get God to reward you. Not at all. This is him understanding. God has loved me. And I love him. And if I love God, I will live according to his ways. Right? Right? John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Well, David said at the beginning, I love you, O Lord. And now we're seeing him say, I have kept your commandments. How does David keep the commandments of God? God. God is his strength. God is his stronghold. God is his shield. God is his horn of his salvation. When we love God, we will walk according to his word. 
And that's what David is saying here. God has rewarded me because I've walked according to his ways. And I've walked according to his ways because he loves me. He has strengthened me. He has given me all I need. So this is not a reward system where you earn from God. This is God fulfilling his promise that those who walk in righteousness will be blessed. God is faithful to fulfill his promises. Now notice David says something very key in verse 22. He says, for all his ordinances were before me. And I did not put away his statutes from me. Basically, I kept God's word in front of me. This is the way that I live my life. This is the way that I sought to understand God. I kept his word in front of me. And this is the success of David. That he knew God. That he knew God according to his statutes and his ordinances. Family, you and I, we have to know what the word says. God has given us the Bible, the word of God as a gift so that we can know him. We read the word, the Holy Spirit reveals to us who God is through it and we can see God. We can see his love, we can see his mercy and his grace and his joy and that he delights in us. The word is vital for us in times of trial and in times of beauty. We have to know God's word because God will use it to show us that he is our stronghold and that we always have peace in him. Let's look at those last two verses, 23 and 24. It says, I was also blameless with him and I kept myself from iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me, rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his eyes. Notice that last little couple words there, in his eyes. The only eyes that matter. Was David righteous according to the world? No. Would anyone in Israel call him righteous? No. Doesn't matter. The question is, what does God call him? And God called him a man after my own heart. God has called his hands clean and that is the only opinion that matters. What has God said of you? He says here, I have kept myself from all of this stuff. I am blameless. God has loved me. He has cleaned my hands. And so his response is, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I love you. So God has given David the grace to be blameless, the grace to walk in obedience, the grace to love God, and the grace to fulfill everything that God has called him to do. That same grace is available to you and me. Aloha, I'm Derek, the executive pastor at One Love. And I want to say thank you for tuning in today. We hope that you were inspired and strengthened with today's celebration. If you're new to One Love, we encourage you to visit us online at onelove.org and fill out a connect card so we can keep you up to date with all the things happening here. While you're there, you can also learn more about One Love, submit prayer requests, or see more of our studies through the Bible. There are many ways to stay connected, so we encourage you to take that first step. If you're watching today's celebration via YouTube, we encourage you to subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to keep informed with new messages. Most importantly, if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, we encourage you to click on our I Said Yes to Christ link at the bottom of the website and fill out the form so we can stay connected. One last thing, if you want to learn more about the good news of Jesus Christ, we encourage you to visit goodnewshawaii.com. There you'll find five short videos about living a life in Christ and a free discipleship booklet designed to encourage you your new faith. Mahalo for tuning in to One Love Today. We hope you were blessed by our time together. Aloha.